He doth give his joy to all. He becomes an infant small. He becomes a man of woe. He doth feel the sorrow too. Welcome to the Troubadour Podcast. Today we will be covering On Another's Sorrow by William Blake. Now, this is the last poem of the Songs of Innocence. And if you've been following along, you can um, you know, always go to Troubadour Podcast or TroubadourMag.com and you know, look at the other ones that I've done. But I've now gone through every single poem in the Songs of Innocence. And this is a poem, or this is a book of poetry originally published in 1789 and then republished in 1794, including the Songs of Experience. So it became known as the Songs of Innocence and Experience, showing the two contrary states of the human soul by William Blake. And this is coming out of the time of the French Revolution, and which is 1789, when the whole European way of life is being turned on its head. It was a kind of a, you know, called the Copernican political revolution in a, in a kind of a reversal of all the norms that everybody thought or had always existed on at that time. It was a big upheaval. And, you know, there was an innocence to it that I think um, Wordsworth, or excuse me, Wordsworth Blake is expressing in Songs of Innocence although there's always a tint of experience in it. And, you know, go to some of my previous ones, especially the poem, The Echoing Green. And so there's always this element of the experience that we see in the uh, in these poems. So the darkness and, you know, what experience means is the awareness often of the horrors, the terrors, the sorrows, the tragedies, the, you know, the sorrows in this case. And in this poem, we're going to be looking at a very common Blake theme, or at least an idea that he's working with, even though he is the most Christian of all the romantic poets of this time. And if you remember, the romantic poets are Blake Wordsworth Coleridge in the early romantics and then right or the first generation, and then right after them would be uh, Shelley, Gordon, Lord Gordon, Byron, and um, Keats. And those would be considered the second generation of the, the English Romantic poets. And of them, and of many of the artists at this time, he is the most Christian of all of them, but he is very anti-church. He's very anti-establishment. Because he is against, as an artist of this era, and you know, of many artists since, to some degree, um, um, that's an argue uh, that's arguable. He, but it, it, Blake for sure is very against repression. You know, the the repression of your natural desires, such as sexual desires, and oppression. That is, you know, coming from the outside and oppressing your freedom to act as a human in nature, to be a natural being. Now, in here we're getting, you know, the, the title is simply On Another's Sorrow. And he's going to express a view that we'll see, that we've already seen, and we're going to see some more when we explore the songs of experience, about this question of why is there sorrow in a world with a benevolent God? What is the the essence of God's love? Because he does believe in a benevolent or at least an all-powerful God, and he's always questioning, well, there is this thing, but why is there sorrow? What do we do in this world that we live in? The church has failed us, so what are other options? So, um, and then at the end, I do want to, so in this one, we're going to talk about the theme. We're going to see how he executes this. We're going to read this poem. It's a very pleasantly uh, audible poem. It sounds nice to hear, just like many of his poems, uh, uh, many great poems in general should sound nice, at least to some degree, because you should have a meter a rhythm. And I'm going to throw out something. I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is teach a quick little term, a rhetorical term that many great poets use. It's a simple one, but it's a very effective one. And I'll just say right now, it's called anaphora, anaphora. And I'll spell it and we'll 
I'll put it up if you're on. Um, I'll, I'll put it up now. I'm not going to explain it yet, but we'll talk about it later. So if you're on TubadorMag.com and you're watching on you or on YouTube or Facebook, you'll see it. It's A N A P H O R A, and we'll talk about it afterward, just to kind of tease you if you've heard of what that is, and um, you know we'll see what this means and then how it can be used. Um, you know, in speech writing, for instance, to really spice up a speech. And we'll see that this is a great rhetorical device. And one of the reasons I want to bring it up is because it will help you understand why poetry is meant to be read aloud. It's not meant to be read in your head exclusively. Okay, so let's go through this. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. So let's do a reading. And if you again, if you're on the visual mediums, um, you can see me read this. I have the text popped up. If you are on the podcast, that's fine. We'll read it and then we'll go through the poem stanza by stanza. So you'll get to hear it again in order to get a deeper understanding of the poem. Okay. On Another Sorrow by William Blake. Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief and not seek for kind relief? Can I see a falling tear and not feel my sorrow share? Can a father see his child weep nor be with sorrow filled? Can a mother sit and hear an infant groan, an infant fear? No, no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. And can he who smiles on all Hear the wren with sorrows small, hear the small bird's grief and care, hear the woes that infants bear, and not sit beside the nest, pouring pity in their breast, and not sit the cradle near, weeping tear on infant's tear, and not sit both night and day, wiping all our tears away. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. He doth give his joy to all. He becomes an infant small. He becomes a man of woe. He doth feel the sorrow too. Think not thou canst sigh a sigh, and thy maker is not by? Think not thou canst weep a tear, and thy maker is not near. Oh, he gives to us his joy, that our grief he may destroy. Till our grief is fled and gone, he doth sit by us and moan. Okay. So I think this is a rather simple poem, and it's there are some layers to it, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, one that is the deepest of all poems ever written, but it has a, a rhythm and it has a clear message. I think the message, the theme is simply on God's love. And that's really what the theme is. And it's a questioning. It's also, you know, it, it deals with it in a real sense where it's a real person, not like a fanatic that just believes in it and does. It's someone who's asking questions and thinking, you know, at least asking questions about what they're normally told about God's love. So, Let's uh, let's break this down a little bit. So, on another sorrow, William Blake. Can I see another's woe? W O E. So, can I see another person suffering, going through some problems? Maybe they're diseased, right? Like, think about this. Is I'm recording this. What day is this? This is the I'm losing track of days sometimes because of the quarantine that we're in, and I'm just so the days are blending together. So, today is April tenth. It's Friday. So this, you know, I'm going on my first full month of quarantine and being locked down. And, um, you know, there's a lot of woe out there. There's a lot of, there are actual people suffering with the disease and there's also people suffering or with the virus, I I should say that's COVID-19 or coronavirus. There are people who are losing their jobs. I'm reading about businesses that are shutting down forever now. That means people who spent a lifetime building this thing is now having to give it up, right? So can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? That's the essence of empathy. That's what empathy or sympathy is. So just to be clear, this is what empathy literally means. It's the the, the feeling that or the sharing of the feeling with another person. So if another person is 
um, suffering a loss and you're empathetic with them, it's because you are also feeling this, you are simp- uh, uh, suffering the loss with them versus sympathy, which means you feel sorry for them essentially, right? You can, um, you, you say this person has lost a parent, let's say, and you say, oh, how sad for them. But you don't really experience, the, you're not really experiencing the loss yourself. And now there's a lot more we can talk about with what empathy is, but it's a general ability to, sh- or the, I- the idea of sharing another's sorrow. That, and this is something you see with people who are all of this one world, you know, one human, one world view of human nature, that we all share one humanity. And so when one person suffers, another person suffers. Um, my view is that that's not true. We're all individuals, but we can, of course, use the tool of empathy in order to clearer and have a better sharing of under of, of understanding what another person's going through. And literature is a really good tool for doing that. So that's how this poem begins: is can I, you know, the narrator, can I? He's asking himself this question: Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief and not seek for kind relief? So he doesn't answer. He's just asking, you know, if I saw someone suffering on the side of the road, would I not feel anything for them? Would I just like drive over them and not care? Right. This is the common view of how many of us are today is that we don't care about other people, which I don't think is true, but he's asking him, but you know, ask yourself that question. Seriously. If you saw a person drowning, would you just not feel anything for them and just let them go? Or if you were walking by and you saw someone in a car accident, would you not feel sorrow for them if they're injured and feel, oh my gosh, I hope they're okay, right? Um, you know, can I see another's grief? If you saw someone lose a grandparent in this COVID-19, would you not feel anything for the, the sadness that this person who would have lived, would have otherwise lived is now dead because of COVID-19? Would you feel no grief for them, no sorrow for them. Um, and uh, so those are the kinds of things that you should ask yourself. And, and this applies to a lot of things. So for instance, the same applies to uh, someone loses their job, right? And they now could know they're, you know, single parent, let's say, and they can't feed their kids or they're having trouble feeding their kids. Do you feel sorrow for them? Do you feel sorrow for the business owner who had um, a coffee shop that was doing pretty well and now they have to shut it down because they didn't quite have enough to make it through this. And now they're suffering and they're going to have difficulties making it in the future. And everything they've built was invested in this and it's going to cause them a lot of problems. Do you feel sorrow for them? Can I, Can you see another grief and not seek for kind relief? That's what this person's asking themselves. Second stanza. Can I see a falling tear and not feel my sorrows share? So what do you think he means by sorrows share. Now, one thing I'm thinking is that there's, you know, there's almost like a pie of shit of sorrow, right? The, we all have this, this world that we're all equally in to some degree. I think this is what he's somewhat expressing. And there's a share of pie, right? And there's a share of sorrow and this person's feeling it right now. I'll feel it at some other point. Um, you know, so if I see them crying, falling tear, Can I see a falling tear? You know, somebody suffering like we've just been talking about and they cry and not feel my sorrow share. So maybe I take a little bit of that from them. Maybe that's one way to look at that. Or maybe I'm also going to, you know, again, this is the emphasis of the the sorrow or the the empathy theme. But again, he's still asking himself this question. Can a father, now he's switching it. No, it's not no longer him asking about himself. Now he's getting a little bit more intellectual about it, right? So he's he's first starting with me, me, me. Can I do this? Like, let me be honest with myself. He doesn't answer though. But then he asks, well, what about a father? Can a father see his child weep nor be with sorrow filled? So, you know, can a father just sit there, you know, watching TV? Obviously there's no TV back then, but, you know, reading a book or, or talking to somebody and see his son or, or daughter hurt and not care, eh, you know, whatever. Um, and I think, you know, he, uh, in other places, William Blake would say there is, that is possible. And there's a kind of disease that he will discuss at other places where fathers won't care. And you'll see this, and you've seen this even in, on a, a chimney sweeper, for instance, but uh, there's a, there's an empathy even there with William Blake, where in the poem, 
the chimney sweeper, the father sells his son to a chimney sweeper master. So the, the son becomes an apprentice, but he literally sells him. And you see this a couple of times where there's a kind of a trade where they get rid of the son. But we have to think about what that was like for the, these people at that time and why they did it. So see those other videos to get more of that. Now he talked about his the, a mother or a father. Now he's going to talk about a mother. Can a mother sit and hear an infant groan, an infant fear? Now he's finally going to answer the question. No, no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. So it's a real emphasis here. He's, he's stressing it in rhyme. No, no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. And he's, tr you know, all the questions he just answered was no. Okay. So now he has his answer. I could never look at another person and feel no, that's uh, going through a tragedy and feel no sympathy or empathy for them. A father could not look at a son and, not, and that's suffering and not feel sorrow for his son and, you know, not feel, um, you know, not be weep and feel sorrow for his son. A mother could not see her infant groan and not feel sorrow for her son or daughter. Now we're going to get into the, the crux of this and why he's asking the question. Because the question is, why is this narrator? Asked? It's like, what's the point of you asking that? Next answer. And can he who smiles on all hear the wren? With sorrows small, hear the small bird's grief and care, hear the woes that infants bear. So what do you think he means? Who is he talking about now? And can he, capitalizes the he, of course, can he who smiles on all hear the wren, that's a small little bird, with sorrows small, you know, chirping its little tragic song. And you could actually go to YouTube and listen to bird calls. I think you can listen to a wren and what, you know, it sounds a little bit more tr uh, tragic than some other birds. Hear the wren with sorrows small. Hear the small birds grief and care. Hear the woes that infants bear. And not sit beside the nest, pouring pity in their breast. And not sit the cradle near, weeping tear on infant's tear. So now he's asking this deeper philosophical question. How can he, you know, or can he, who's the God of all, right? The creator of everything, the overseer, the benevolent father, hear the little wren. So he's not even talking about a, a person yet. Hear the little bird um, and, and have the, its teeniest, insig you know, seemingly insignificant creature on earth, this little bird. Can he hear it cry and not care? I mean, he's the God of all. So shouldn't the God of all care about all of his creatures and make sure that all of his creatures are happy and, and enjoying life? And yet he can't. And can he also hear woes that infants bear, right? Infants that are abandoned by their parents. Can this he who smiles on all, can he not sit beside the nest? Right? Can he not take the time to every single little bird and sit next to them and make them feel better? Pouring pity in their breast like, and not sit the cradle near. You know, so can he at the very least, or would he at the very least, this, this God, not sit by an infant groaning like the mother would and weep, at least feel empathy for this creature, for this little infant baby? Next stanza. So that I just read two stanzas. And he's going on. So this is still continuing the same sentence. And can he who smiles on all hear the wren with sorrows small, so on and so forth, and not sit both night and day, wiping all our tears away? So that's the question. Can this God not spend his time making us feel better, wiping all our tears away? Oh no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. So his answer is pretty simple. Nope. Just like before. So if you remember what he said at the end of the questions 
You know, he's repeating himself as a refrain. No, no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. So when he says, I can never see another sorrow and not feel something, a father can't do it, a mother can't do it, and God cannot do it. That's his answer. That's his philosophical answer. It's not possible. And you could think of it as a relationship between the two sets of, of stanzas, where you have a set of stanzas you know, that have this refrain at the end of it, oh, no, never can it be, never, never can it be, or never, never can it be. That has to do with human, the actual earthly human realm, and then you have the philosophical question he's asking about God. Can if So we as humans who are lesser than God, we're able to do this empathy thing, right? And we never could see this sorrow. I could never see that. Thus, the question is, this benevolent God, can this benevolent God do the same? Well, if the God is benevolent, never can it be, never, never can it be. It just that can't be. This, can, this cannot be the facts that a God could see this and not wipe away our tears. And then he goes on to explain, this is kind of the, the cashing in on it, you could say. He doth give his joy to all. He becomes an infant small. He becomes a man of woe. He doth feel the sorrow too. He does feel the sorrow too. So he's, his, this first sentence, this is one stanza, one sentence. He gives the answer that God gives his love to all or his joy. To also the joy that we feel, the counterbalance to the sorrow is from God. And that's what is the kind of wiping away of the tear from the wren to the infant, to the man, to the abandoned woman, to the person who loses their job, to the person who, you know, loses a grandparent to COVID-19. It's the, you know, according to William Blake, it's the joy of God that allows that to, all those things to happen. And it's represented in the fact that just like the earlier stage, stages of this poem, when we're empathizing with the groaning infant or the tearful infant, the one of the ways that Jesus or that God in, in the form of Jesus, of course, did this was by becoming an infant. And he doesn't say Jesus. He just refers to the infant. It's you know, it's the kind of idea that God perhaps created this whole universe. There's imperfection. So he sent, you know, it's the, it is the Christian general viewpoint of, um, you know, God as savior. So he becomes an infant small, he becomes a man of woe. And so God becomes and imbibes in a sense, takes on, this is the story of Christianity, takes on the, the sorrows of mankind and all of humanity, all of earthly creatures. And he doth feel the sorrow too. So now uh, William Blake is going to reassure us a little bit. He says, think not thou, think not you canst, can sigh aside. So think you can't sigh aside and thy maker is not by. So to translate that from think not thou canst sigh aside and thy maker is not by would be something like, you know, think not you can sigh a sigh and your maker's not by, you know, so do you think you can sigh a sorrowful sigh and your maker's not right there with you? Think not thou canst weep a tear and thy maker is not near. So you think you can weep a tear and your maker's not next to you? So he's, he's, he's actually stating this um, to some degree, but it's, it's kind of a question. Think not thou, think not you can't sigh a sigh. He's stating think you can't do this. You, you you can't do this. You can't sigh a sigh without your maker being by. You can't weep a tear without your maker being near. Oh, he gives to us his joy that our grief he may destroy. Till our grief is fled and gone, he doth sit by us and moan. So in other words, what we're getting from this is that we have this, we live in this world that has lots of sorrows in it on another sorrow. And we have this benevolent being who isn't, for question, reasons he's not getting into in this poem, he isn't solving all those problems for us, but he is there with us. He's experiencing it with us. So it's not like this Eve. So it's similar in a sense to, you could think of like the father and mother who could, you know, try to make the child feel better, but they can't solve all the problems of the child. So that's what I would, you know, kind of take away from this is that, for whatever reason, there are limitations to what this benevolent God is capable of doing. And, uh, you know, whether it's his plan or whatever it is, but the, at the end of the day, what he is capable or, or he is doing 
is he's empathizing. And you can feel better just like the, the child, the infant, the friend can feel better that you empathize with them, that you share in their sorrow and maybe even try to t- you know, help them make, uh, feel better by having the joy in their life and bringing joy to their life. So too does um, this, this God, this benevolent father figure that we're all living in the shadow of. Now, let me show you the um, pictures of the, the, it's, this one's not, I could not get a really good, uh, cause it's a lot smaller. So this is how small it is. If you remember from other episodes I've done on this, William Blake was also a great artist and he sketched out and drew all these paintings within the original lyrical ballads. And one of the reasons are lyrical ballads. I keep mixing them up with Wordsworth. As you may know, Wordsworth is my favorite, so he's always on my mind. Um, but William Blake with um, Songs of Innocence and Experience, he actually uh, created these plates that he would print on that had all these drawings on them. And then he would hand draw each one. So he created the plates by him, you know, himself. He had his own process for printing with these special plates he made. And he would print off a copy and then he would hand draw it for you. So if you ordered from William Blake in 1795, for instance, you would get a hand created product by William Blake. Now, of course, that meant that there was not a lot of them in, in play. So he was, you know, not the most popular because of his lack of a, um, you know, of mass printing, which was more available. And this is something that later poets like William Wordsworth really fought. Wordsworth, for instance, was the first one to really fight for copyrights of his own work that he could pass on. He wanted to extend them for longer so he could pass it on for at least some period of time to his children. It was part of his wealth. And, um, you know, he, he was also worried about, th- you know, things like, he wanted to print a lot to actually try to make some money, and he tried to create things that would try to make money. Blake was much more a fanatic about the artwork. And so, you know, again, he's hand doing each one of these things. So you could see that this is very intricately drawn if you're looking at troubadourmag.com or YouTube or Facebook. Um, if you're listening, you can just take my word for it. There's a vines with, you know, uh, all along uh, uh, the sides. And there, you know, grapes coming down from them, things of that nature. Now, after this is a picture. This is the last picture, if you're watching, on the um, you know, in the in this book, in Songs of Innocence. Now, of course, there's still Songs of Experience, and if we're reading the 1794 version, you'll remember they go together. But you see that in Songs of Innocence, it ends with this gentleman who's walking and he has a little boy with wings. So it's probably Cupid or an angel. We could think of an angel versus Cupid. And you have these lambs in the background that are peacefully grazing on the grass. And you have this, you know, sunny, sunnily lit grass behind them. But then of course, just like always, again, read or listen to my poem, my discussion of the echoing green, you have this darkness just on the horizon. And, you know, where the darkness is quite coming from, it's hard to say, but it's dark, right? Like, because the sun is behind it. So I guess that's the first shading valley of dark. Now, where does this come from? I've made this argument many times. I'm going to continue to make it. It's really important for us to read these poems as books rather than as individual, you know, off uh, by themselves poems. I think we lose so much when we read them as just like a white piece of paper, like I did without all the color and without it being a book, because the poets of this era who were geniuses, especially the genius ones had a purpose behind all that they were doing. I don't see that as much today. I see much more a hodgepodge of creation, but these poets really had a purpose. So if you remember, this image is hearkening back to the first or the introduction poem called that I called the Piper. It's actually just called the introduction. And the Piper, um, see, I can maybe read it really quickly, quickly to kind of give you a reminder. It's very short. Piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee. On a cloud, I saw a child, and he laughing said to me, Pipe a song about a lamb. So I piped with merry cheer. Piper piped that song again, 
So I piped, he wept to hear. Wept. Think about that. And what we just read. Drop thy pipe, thy happy pipe. Sing thy songs of happy cheer. So I sung the same again, while he wept with joy to hear. Piper, sit thee down and write in a book that all may read. So he vanished from my sight, and I plucked a hollow reed, and I made a rural pen, and I stained the water clear, and I wrote my happy songs every child may joy to hear. So Songs of Innocence is a piper singing these songs about innocent creatures, whether they be wrens or lambs or little boys or little girls or chimney sweepers or little block boys or a myriad of other types of images that we get. This, you know, infants, infant joy, that's what the Songs of Innocence was taking as its crux, as, as its uh, fundamental image, was this piper singing these songs or writing these songs down. And these songs were, if you remember, they're coming from nature. So when we get this song, The Piper, and I go into this a lot more detail in the poem on The Piper, but we have this this man, this you know, young boyish man, teenager perhaps, who's playing a song and he's very much one with nature. And he, you know, so we get the process that human civilization went from uncivilized to civilized, from pre-writing into writing, right? So he's going down, he's just enjoying life. He's just like an animal essentially, except he can, you know, he can sing like the birds, right? Just like birds do. And there, there's a relationship we see in all these poems to how humans can kind of sing and the the sounds that humans make, like the groans and the sad sounds that a, an infant might make, and the the sounds that certain birds and, and animals can make that seem kind of sad. And then this man sees a child that you know, tells him to pipe a song about the lamb. Um, so he does. He sings about a lamb, and of course, lamb is a sacrificial lamb. Is one way to think about a lamb, but it's also the image of innocence. It's essence of innocence. Um, you know, they don't fight, they don't bite, they don't do anything, and yet they they're you know, mauled by tigers and you know, taken for their wool, it's, it's often taken for their meat, and they're just sacrificial lambs. And there's another sacrificial lamb, of course, in Christianity, which is, which is of course, Jesus Christ. So he's never mentioned in here, but he's referred to often in the sense of sacrificial lamb. So he's told by this child to, to sing this song. He pipes, the piper uh, does it, and then this child tells him to do it again. He pipes, and then the child, the angel essentially weeps, right? So this is, he's starting to see this, there's that element of sorrow that's in experience. So every, you know, the book is called showing the two contrary states of the human soul. So we're getting these contrary states. We're getting the innocence and the experience. And with the innocence is a naivety, you know, the lamb is not aware that it's about to be slaughtered, right? But it's there. So it's enjoying its life, but right around the corner is terror. Um, drop thy pipe, thy happy pipe, sing thy songs of happy cheer. And so the, you know, he keeps tell, the angel keeps telling the piper to sing. He keeps singing and the angels cries more, maybe because the angel knows something the piper doesn't know. And then the angel tells him pipe, the, uh, piper sit thee down and write. So now we go from the inspiration to the actual creation, um, the, in, the, the inspiration and then spontaneous outburst like an animal uh, an animal's inspired to you know just sing just because it is it's just an animal versus this man who now goes to create something something lasting something that can pass down and there's something lost in that because he stains the water clear right it's a great line and i stained the water clear and every child made joy to hear and so that's the the piper and then we get at the end where we have this other, you know, not a piper, but he has this angel on his head and he has this angel on his head. He's got lambs in the same kind of position as before. He's been walking. He's probably been telling stories just like he was told. 
And, um, you know, now he's going to be walking. He's, there's a kind of more maturity to it. He's more, he's lost the pipe and it's just him walking and there's a darkness behind him, which you kind of see, but not really in the, the Piper, um, introduction. Oh. So, you know, the reason I, I try to bring those things up is I think it's important to put these all in context that on another sorrow is a kind of way for us to ask this question of a God in a very, you know, in critical and difficult to ask way. And, um, you know, it's, this is William Blake's answer. Now, I want to just quickly end by giving you this word, and, if, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right because I keep mispronouncing it, uh, anaphora, anaphora, I believe is how you pronounce it, anaphora. And this is a um, device that you see a lot in Blake and a lot in great rhetoricians. So anaphora, an, anaphora, <laughs> A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A, is very simply the um, repetition of the first word or phrase in a line. So here's some famous ones in speeches. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength, and so on and so forth. So this is Winston Churchill's um, famous speech. And then there's Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, You know, and there's Many, many examples of this. You can look this up. There's tons of literary examples of this. Of course, um, you get this in William Blake all the time. You get this in the refrain. But you get this also when he says things like, and can he who smiles on all hear the wren with sorrow small, hear the small bird's grief and care, hear this woes that infants bear. And what you're getting when he does that is your the repetition emphasizes, and it's and especially when you hear it, it kind of goes in the ear and it, you know, you, you lose the sense of the, the first word, even though you know the first word um, intimately because it's hear the wren, hear the, uh, the small birds, hear the woes, right? You, you hear them literally to some degree. You can hear them and this allows it to resonate and then the changes um, also add power. So it's just a way for um, a, a speaker to really hammer home this idea by kind of repeating it with slight variations and new new um, images to emphasize. And you see this in poetry a lot. And this is one example of why poetry is meant to be heard out loud because it has a different um, set of rules. So one of the things that grammar is, in writing is supposed to be doing is it's supposed to help when you've removed all of the audio and visual rules or experience of talking. So if you're watching me talk, you you can watch me say like all the visual rules, you know, and I'm putting like a box on the screen with my hands, right? Because that's what I think of when I have a rule just subconsciously. And, and there's a lot you could see with my face, with my facial experience that, a facial ex- uh, expression that is expressing a certain view. And I just, you know, said, if you're, if you're listening, I said expressing and I, exp- I emoted by lifting my eyebrows and by moving my body forward and, and shaking my head up and down. So you can watch this to see. And there's a, so all of that is gone when you write and especially in prose, but poetry retains some of those things because it's meant to be heard. So it retains, so although it's often, you know, it's written for us to repeat, it is heard. It's meant to be heard. And therefore it has certain elements from speech or rhetoric or the rhetorical um, part of our language that we're able to, um, that, you know, we have, we have this, rules that we have. We have these sets of standards that are there that you don't have to know anaphora or how to pronounce it properly or even the definition to get it. Although I think it's maybe interesting for some of you, but what you need to know is that this is something that's valuable in reading it out loud and that you're missing something fundamentally if you're not 
hearing it out loud. It's like um, reading the, um, you know, comp. it's like reading musical composition and notes versus hearing a symphony. It's totally different experience. Even if you're good and you can hear in your head when you read, if you're, if you're good at sight reading and you can hear the piano concerto in your head, it's still not the same as actually hearing it out loud. And so, um, and that takes a lot of training even to get there. Uh, now, so you may have done a lot of reading and you could do a little bit of it, of the hearing it in your head, but it's still not going to be the same as being washed over with a good reading. And sometimes the best way to do that is to do it yourself and to at least hear yourself say it out loud. So that I really, you know, just wanted to emphasize, especially with these types of things, like a lot of the power of it and to get the, the empathy that he's trying to help you hear is to, um, do, do it out loud to hear it out loud. Okay. So that's the last poem of on another sorrow by, or uh, of songs of innocence by William Blake. Next time we're going to start exploring songs of experience. Thank you. And I'll see you next time.